the Jewish Community Relations Council here in St. Louis, the Bernadine Center at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Today's conversation is also supplemented by the documentary film, Holy Silence, released in January, 2020. It's a film that chronicles the Vatican's reaction to the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany, and how Pope Pius XII in particular responded to the horrors of the Holocaust. And it also includes the very interesting contrast between Pope Pius XI and his successor on this question. Uh, if you registered for tonight's event, you should have received an email with the link for a free viewing of that film, and we know that many of you have watched it. It's also fine if you haven't yet watched it. Uh, you can still uh, understand the conversation tonight, but trust me that you'll want to do so after this discussion between Professor David Kurtzer, who is featured prominently as an expert in the film, and Father John Polakowski. So let me introduce both of our discussants now, along with our moderator, Maharat Rory picker -Nice. Pulitzer Prize winning author David Kurtzer is the Paul Dupuis University Professor of Social Science at Brown University. His most recent book, The Pope Who Would Be King, tells the dramatic story of the Roman Revolution of 1848, when the Pope was driven into exile and the end of the papal theocracy was proclaimed. Kurtzer's previous book, The Pope and Mussolini, The Secret History of Pius XI and the Rise of Fascism in Europe, won the Pulitzer Prize for Biography in 2015 and the American Historical Association Prize for Best Book in Italian History. Kurtzer's previous books include Amalia's Tale, Prisoner of the Vatican, and The Popes Against the Jews. Kurtzer's The Kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara was a finalist for the National Book Award in 1997. Kurtzer is an authority on Italian politics, society, and history, political symbolism, and anthropological demography. He is co-founder and served for many years as co-editor of the Journal of Modern Italian Studies. In 2005, Kurtzer was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and from 2006 to 2011, he was the provost of Brown. John Polakowski is a member of the Order of Friar Servants of Mary, or Servites, and was ordained at the University of St. Mary of the Lake. One of the founding faculty members of the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, he served on the faculty from 1968 until his retirement in 2017. He is the author of 10 books, including the Challenge of the Holocaust for Christian Theology, Christ in the Light of the Christian Jewish Dialogue, and Jesus and the Theology of Israel. He is former director of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program, a part of the Bernadine Center for Theology and Ministry at CTU. Father Polakowski has been an active participant in the Christian Jewish Dialogue, as well as the wider interreligious dialogue for nearly 50 years. He served for six years as president of the International Council of Christians and Jews and has served several terms on the board of the Parliament of the World's Religions. He was deeply involved in the development of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and was appointed to the Memorial Council in 1980 by then President Jimmy Carter. And he was subsequently uh, reappointed by Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Tonight's moderator is Maharat Rory picker Nice, who is the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis. Prior to that, she was the director of programming, education, and community engagement at Bayes Abraham Congregation in University City. She is one of the first graduates of the pioneering institution training Orthodox Jewish women to be spiritual leaders and halakhic authorities. She previously served as acting executive director for Religions for Peace USA, program coordinator for the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, assistant director of interreligious affairs for the American Jewish Committee and secretariat for the International Jewish Committee on Interreligious Consultations, the formal Jewish representative in international interreligious dialogue. Okay, so the central question we're addressing here can be expressed in simple terms, although it's not a simple issue at all. Could the Catholic Church have done more 
leading up to and during the Holocaust? Did church leaders at the very highest level abdicate their own principles and their responsibility to confront and resist the untold suffering and death of millions of people? Might some Catholic leaders even have supported the Nazis and been indifferent to the plight of Jewish victims? Or did Catholic leaders at the Vatican work behind the scenes to save thousands of Jews, both locally and across Europe, while trying not to bring undue attention upon the church from the Nazis? Was Pius's silence necessary to keep the church safe and prevent the Nazis from bombing Vatican City? As the film Holy Silence documents clearly, Pope Pius XII, who headed the church from 1939 until 1958, insisted upon a stance of total neutrality during World War II, refusing to publicly criticize Hitler's anti-Semitic policies well after the mass killing of Jewish men, women, and children was well known. The holy silence, that is, was his, and it reverberated widely within the church. Some 80 years later, many now seek a reckoning. Just over a year ago, in March 2020, the Vatican opened its archives covering the papacy of Pius XII. Now, just to be clear, thousands of Vatican documents from the war era had already been released in recent decades, as the Vatican fought rumors that Pius had collaborated with the Nazis and the fascists. But many more were sealed until last year, when the full archive was made available to researchers. Writing of the importance of this release, Professor Kurtzer noted, Holocaust denial might be dismissed as the delirium of a crackpot fringe, but denial of responsibility for the war and for the Holocaust remains widespread in Europe and in the Christian churches. A few months after the unsealing, Professor Kurtzer reported on these newly available documents in a stunning article in The Atlantic, which was published last August. These documents, which are millions of pages that will take years to fully comb through, promise to tell us more about the Pope's silence, his refusal not to protest even after the Germans rounded up and deported Rome's Jews in 1943, taking them to Auschwitz where most of them died. The newly available documents, Kurtzer tells us, illuminate private conversations the internal wranglings of Vatican leaders over whether the Pope should protest these deaths or not. Monsignor Angelo Delacqua prevailed, arguing that it was quite opportune to be wary of the Jews' influence. Government laws should be used to restrict the rights of Jews. This was necessary to protect Christians from alleged Jewish crimes. As Delacqua wrote, there was no lack in the history of Rome of measures adopted by the pontiff to limit the influence of the Jews, end quote. The Pope remained silent. Some years later, when the chief rabbi of Palestine, Isaac Herzog, begged the Pope to help get the missing Jewish children orphaned by the Holocaust, many of them now baptized Catholic, returned to Jewish guardians by issuing a public call for their release, Delacqua advised the Pope not to make any such statement, nor really do anything at all. And Pius apparently took his advice. Few Catholic thinkers have worked as hard to address the challenge of these painful events to the church and the challenges of historical anti-Semitism to Catholics more broadly, as well as the silence that enables all racisms than Professor Palakowski. And I am profoundly grateful to you, Father, for your honest engagement with issues and realities that I know bring sorrow to Catholics. And Professor Kurtzer, I am profoundly grateful to you for your own crucial work that makes it impossible for us to avoid or deny these hard truths. All of us undergo reckonings of different kinds, great and small, and they are hard. However, beloved, Pius XII may be to many Catholics still, this is a reckoning that must be had at every level of the church. And now let me turn things over to Maharat Pikernice for this discussion. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Griffith, and thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm really uh, so delighted to, to host two such prominent scholars on this issue and uh, to be part of this conversation. So let me, let me say this is, we're gonna try to keep this as a conversation as much as possible. I do know that there's numerous of you who are watching. Um, I will be looking at the chat and at the Q and A and trying to incorporate questions as we go. Um, but let me start off with this really big question um, for the two of you and, and either one of you is welcome to start. But so Dr. Griffith really framed the issue for us in terms of the history, but I wanna really push us in terms of saying, what's at stake in this conversation? Why, why are we talking about somebody who died over 60 years ago, something that happened over 70 years ago? What's at stake for us in talking about this? Well, let me begin since the question was put is what is at stake, <clears throat> particularly for the Catholic Church. Um, I think put in a single word, I would say integrity. Uh, integrity based on authentic transparency. Um, I think we need to try to delineate what Pius XII did and more perhaps what he didn't do through um, research uh, in the archives, which as you was already indicated will be a monumental effort that may take as much as a, de a decade. Uh, let me just comment uh, there actually is not a single archive. Uh, what we're talking about right now in terms of the release of documents cover about five or six archives. It becomes more complex because access to the archives require access to and permission to look at each of the archives. There is no overarching permission to look at all of them. So it becomes a very complex process to even get access to them. And it's been made more complicated by the COVID crisis, which has closed um, the Vatican archives for several times in recent months. But for me, especially coming to the discussion from the standpoint of someone specializing in social ethics, I have to ask the question, what is the implications of the way Pius XII handled one of the most fundamental moral crises facing the Catholic Church? And I think the problem that we already know uh, is a reality in the way that he did handle it is the fact that he was very much of a uh, a pope dedicated to um, the idea that, in fact, his job was to protect the self-interest of the church and its operations as his primary um, responsibility. Uh, protecting the human rights or the lives of other people, especially those who are not Catholic, was not a high priority for anyone with some exceptions, but for most people in the Catholic Church of his time. The, the movement of those kinds of issues to the center of Catholic responsibility is something that primarily occurred in and through the Vatican Council uh, and the uh, subsequent writings and discussions on that. And that continues today. But Pius XII, I think, saw his role as in a very diplomatic um, uh, as, way. Uh, I think it's terribly important to remember that he, he inherited diplomacy in his mother's milk, if I can put it that way. His father was a very committed um, Italian diplomat that loved the... Um, the idea of the old papal states. I think most Catholics for, uh, are just not aware that the Catholic Church was not just a religious institution, it was a very real political institution during the period of the papal states, which of course collapsed in the face of revolutionary Europe. But his father was very, very upset 
about the demise of the papal states and really uh, experienced some new joy when in 1929, the Vatican mini state was reestablished. But Pius XII uh, grew up in the atmosphere of diplomacy. He, um, he was targeted for the Vatican diplomatic corps uh, even before his ordination. Uh, and he, um, he really imbued that sense of what it meant to be Pope. It meant to be um, the chief diplomat of the church. This doesn't mean that he didn't uh, do some things, but I don't think that saving Jews or even saving Poles during the Holocaust, who also sought his assistance and were very uh, angry that he, by and large, did not uh, offer such assistance. Um, uh, this was not, from his point of view, his main um, responsibility. And I, I think the, what we really need to ask uh, in today's church is, what do we do in times of grave social crisis? What is the role of religious leadership in such times? And you know, um, there was a very interesting counter example that took place in the small African country of Malawi about a, a decade or so after the, probably more than that, but uh, within the first two decades after the actual Nazi Holocaust had ended. And there the president, Dr. Hastings Banda, tried to literally exterminate people who practiced indigenous religion. Uh, and the Catholic bishops of the country, uh, most of them foreigners, to a person stood up and said, you cannot do this. This is wrong. You, you must stop the killing. And he said to them, I, can, I, I will destroy your churches and I will um, kill your catechists, which certainly would bring down the the structural uh, stability of the Catholic Church. But they said, go ahead. Uh, uh, I think this was a counter example to the cautious uh, diplomatic approach to the whole Nazi era that I think uh, mo uh, motivated Pius XII and is something that I think we have to seriously, seriously question in today's Catholic Church. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you've hit on many points that uh, we could uh, discuss, and maybe we'll get a chance to discuss some of them. Let, let me just uh, I'll go back to the you know, this larger question of what's at stake. And I see it um, in terms of what accounted for the Holocaust. I mean, this is part of what's at stake. Um, how could it have been possible in the middle of this? I think I said in the film, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, at what had been regarded as you know, one of the most advanced uh, civilizations in, in world history and certainly European history that um, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people could have uh, felt that uh, murdering Jewish children and old people and, and women and, and so on uh, was a good thing to be doing. And so yeah, from my point of view, um, you know, there's a bit of a, on the one hand, Pius XII is a, a crucial figure, but it is even beyond you know, the personality of, of Pius XII and his strong points and his limitations. Um, the, you know, John Paul II, and uh, because of the controversy over the silence of the Pope, uh, called on a Vatican commission to look into this question of whether the church bore any responsibility for the demonization of the Jews that could have led to the Holocaust. And after you know, practically a dozen years, this commission uh, produced its report in 1998 called We Remember. People can look it up online if they're interested. And uh, it, uh, what it basically said was that unfortunately it's true there had been uh, negative religious ideas about uh, Jews for many centuries in the church, not just the Catholic church, but the Christian churches in general. Uh, but this had nothing to do with the kind of demonization of the Jews that led to the Holocaust. That was something more modern, was racial in nature and so on. And, um, you know, this, this is just not, not real history from, as a historian. It's a kind of uh, wishful history. Um, and uh, so 
The question from my point of view is not just about this silence of uh, Pius XII during the Holocaust, but uh, how the Holocaust could have, could have taken place. And, and one of the reasons I think that's not recognized, uh, and I have been working in these newly opened Vatican archives, one of the reasons that hasn't been recognized for the Pope's silence is he was afraid that, it wasn't that he was afraid uh, only that the uh, Nazis might take action against the institutional church if he were to be critical of them. He was afraid of Catholics in Germany, that many, many of them were Nazis, the loyal Nazis, and that he could produce a schism in the church. Uh, and there had been something of a schism in the Protestant churches in Germany along these lines. So uh, there are some very uh, crucial questions here that, and put it even in a larger perspective as someone who works in Italian history, it's not just that the church uh, the Catholic Church has had a hard time coming to terms with this history. It's uh, Italy, for example, as well. Uh, the fact that Italy was part of the Axis powers and the ally of Hitler is not an impression you generally get when you talk to Italians who will talk about the resistance. We just celebrated a uh, kind of resistance anniversary, April 25th. Uh, and uh, the fact that the, uh, the, the Italians were, in fact, allied to the Nazis and would have, uh, there would have been a, Mussolini would st still have been in power much longer if they had actually won the war, as many, most people, including the Pope, thought they would, which is the other aspect in trying to understand why Pius XII remained silent and wouldn't criticize a Mussolini or Hitler. He thought they were going to win the war, as did many people, for good reason, given how uh, rapidly the uh, German army advanced uh, first through Poland and then through uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and, and France, and drove the you know, British famously at Dunkirk uh, off the, the continent. So yeah, this is all part of a much larger coming to terms with history. So, so building off of that, um, I, I was saying just before um, some people came on, if you were here for sort of like the chit chat beforehand, um, I, I was saying that I, I remember when I first started working in, in Catholic Jewish relations, which was really, I think, some of my first foray into interfaith work, um, it seemed like this was the big topic of conversation. It was about the archives of Pope Pius XII and the canonization of Pope Pius XII. But, but to be really honest, when I first started talking about doing this program and, and bringing the two of you together, there were some people who, who pushed back at me and said, we shouldn't be doing this and, and that this might really um, be upsetting to Catholic Jewish relations, that this would be offensive to our Catholic partners to, uh, to raise this question. And, and so I'm curious, Father Polakowski, if, if you can comment on, as somebody who's done Catholic Jewish relations and deeply embedded in this work, um, you know, for, for the people who feel like we shouldn't be talking about this because we've, we've come so far, you know, this, this would be damaging to look back. Um, what is your response to that? I think we have to be completely open in terms of the discussion about the historic relationship between Jews and Christians over the centuries. Um, the late Father Edward Flannery, who kind of opened the discussion with his uh, book, The Anguish of the Jews, uh, around the time of the Second Vatican Council, always uh, remarked that the pages of history that Jews knew the best in terms of the relationship with Christians and Christian states um, is the history that is least known among many, many Catholics. Um, we have to admit in Catholicism the dark side of the history of the church. Uh, I would say the dark side of religion as such. Religion, contrary to what some people would proclaim, was not, has not always been on the side of justice, goodness, etc. It has a checkered history, and that also holds true for the Catholic Church as well as Protestant churches. Um, and it seems to me the Nazi era uh, represents one of the most challenging periods of testing um, the true meaning of what it, uh, true meaning of the church in terms of its uh, relationship to Jews, but to other uh, groups in, in the world as well, and, and, and the failures therein. 
Uh, let me just make a couple comments on which, what the, um, Dr. Kurtzer just said. Um, just a slight correction. Actually, we remember the 1998 document on the Shoah was largely written by the um, Holy See's Commission for Religious Relations with Jews, um, headed at the time by Cardinal Edward Idris Cassidy of Australia, who just died literally a few weeks ago. And um, it, it did take into account the commission's work that uh, Dr. Kurtzer referred to. That commission basically examined the um, 12 or so volumes of archival material that were released uh, under Paul, Pope Paul VI. Um, but the commission itself did not write, we remember. But he's absolutely correct. Uh, and it's very problematical. Uh, that document had certain benefits. It put Holocaust education, for example, on the Catholic table, but it also distorted significantly. And there was no one more aware of that than the late Cardinal Cassidy, who was a very close friend of mine. Uh, Cardinal Cassidy was forced to accept uh, as a condition of releasing the document, forced to accept um, distortions in the history of the time um, imposed on him by the Congregation for Sacred Doctrine in the Vatican, which has to uh, rule on every single document that comes from the Vatican. And they put it quite bluntly to him, either you accept uh, the changes that we are proposing or the document will not be approved for formal release. And he made a very, very hard choice to go ahead and, and release the document uh, while he was quite well aware of its significant limitations. And one of the limitations, uh, the, maybe the most serious limitation uh, was the claim that it was somehow only wayward Christians who had supported the Nazis. That is simply nonsense, uh, as I think Dr. Kurtzer has rightly said. Um, the people who supported uh, from the Catholic Church, who supported the Nazi movement, or at least were indifferent to its uh, violent attack on the Jews and other victims, uh, did so because of a long, long tradition of uh, anti-Judaism uh, that really merged into anti-Semitism throughout Christian history. And the attitude of the uh, influential uh, person who advised uh, Pius XII on some of the decisions, only um, his, his outlook only um, uh, represents the kind of prevailing outlook that was present in so much of Catholicism before Vatican II. Um, the other distortion historically, which Cardinal Cassidy had to accept was the claim that most uh, Christians tried to, uh, Catholic Christians tried to save Jews and only a, a minority collaborated. That simply is a total uh, factual um, inaccuracy. Uh, so I think it's, it's very, very critical that we put um, the historical record straight and we really deal with its implications as it actually occurred, not as a fictitious history in order to sort out certain questions we face presently in the church, church about responding to moral crises. So, so let me... It's notable uh, that um, the German bishops recently came out with a statement um, accepting responsibility and expressing regret for their support of, um, of the war, of the Nazi war effort. And the, the French uh, bishops came out with a statement expressing re regret for uh, some of their role in uh, 
supporting the, the Peytown regime that was involved in exporting the Jews to their death in um, Nazi death camps. Uh, so that you know, one thing I think we need to recognize, and we see it, of course, that's really embodied in Father Palakowski, that often you talk about the church or the Vatican. In fact, it's a very heterogeneous um, organization with over a billion people. And so uh, it's not uh, one thing I think that's important, as we're seeing, I think, in our discussion, that it's not a matter of the Jews versus the Catholics. This is something that um, has divided Catholic opinion, and including it at the highest levels, as we're seeing. You know, the question of uh, some folks thinks it's better not we don't talk about this because somehow it's going to uh, make for uh, more controversy. Uh, I'm reminded that I had, when my book came out on the role of the Vatican in the rise of modern anti-Semitism, um, which is called the Popes Against the Jews, maybe a little too provocatively, uh, we were going to have the big uh, event launching the book in New York was going to... Um, uh, take place at the Hillel Center of NYU with a very um, prominent cast of characters from all religious traditions and so forth. And a week before that event, I got a call from my uh, from Knopf telling me, the publisher, that it was canceled. It was canceled because it was, in this case, the Hillel director and rabbi decided, no, uh, they, they were getting too many calls of people upset about us bringing up this topic. They, they really didn't want to do it. So we had to move the event a, a block or two to a center at NYU. So one hears also, and, and this, by the way, has to do, uh, often you hear the argument about Israel here. That is, look, uh, we need the support of the Catholic Church for Israel. That should be our priority. This is all ancient history. Let's not bring that up. Uh, and let's be grateful uh, to the church for being supportive today in our of what the, our organizational uh, Jewish priorities are. So unfortunately, the, these kinds of repression of the history rather than trying to understand it is uh, we find not just Catholics, but also uh, Jews. Let me just uh, add one point that I think we have to pursue this history, not only on, uh, up to the end of uh, Nazism, but uh, I think we also have to look at Pius XII's record in the immediate post-Nazi era, uh, because he no longer had to fear the supposed problems that some would say kept them from responding, such as the bombing of Italy and the Vatican and so on. Uh, that was no longer a, a reality, a real possibility, and he could have made some decisions uh, to really try to bring particularly German Catholics into a conversation about their failure and responsibility. And he did the almost the contrary. Uh, David, you may know at least the name of Gordon Zahn. Uh, Gordon Zahn wrote the first book on uh, German Catholics and Hitler's wars. Uh, he happened to have been a professor of mine at the undergraduate level at um, Loyola University here in Chicago. And he worked very closely with a historian named Edward Gar Gargan who eventually went on to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Gargan was, was passionate as a Catholic historian about the failure of Pius XII in the Vatican. Um, but um, the Vatican actually tried to get um, uh, Professor Zahn fired from Loyola University for raising the question of Pius XII um, and the failure of the German churches. Uh, so even after World War II, there was not only silence about the possibility of collaboration or at least uh, avoidance of any protest. Um, there was even a, a, a concrete effort to undercut people in the Catholic Church who were trying, like, Professor Zahn, who are trying to begin that conversation about Catholic responsibility. So let me let me we're we're getting a lot of questions coming in, which is very exciting, and and I'm I want to try to get to all of them. But before I get to some of the audience questions, I, I want to really kind of you know, Dr. Kurtzer, you 
you were one of the few people who was actually able to go to the archives before um, things were shut down. And I would love if you could, I know we've, we've touched on the history in, in many ways, both of you have um, expertise in this area, but I'm, I'm curious if you could share some of what you might have expected to find and then some of what you actually found when you accessed the archives. Yes, yeah, so the archives opened, uh, the, the timing wasn't good as was uh, referred to, but they opened March 2nd a year ago, 20. And I was there. Uh, and with... Italy was not the greatest place to be at the start of COVID. No, and so the you know, epidemic had already begun, but things hadn't shut down. And, and they did open March 2nd, so I was there, you know, for 30 to it as they opened the door uh, to what used to be called the Vatican Secret Archives, and now it's called the Vatican Apostolic Archive, um, and spent that week there for the 44, 45 hours, I guess, that they allowed me there, and in the Secretary of State Archive, which is just across the courtyard. As Father Polakowski mentioned, there are a number of different archives that are important, also the Inquisition Archive, where I work. Um, and uh, fortunately, they then, uh, that Friday, they announced they were closing it down till further notice. There was a lockdown in Italy. I more or less uh, had to leave the country. Uh, fortunately, uh, they reopened in early June. And although uh, they occasionally had to pause briefly, it's largely been open uh, under reduced, somewhat reduced hours uh, since then. And unfortunately, I work, I have a collaborator who's Roman, who's Italian, a historian, and he's been there working these archives essentially every day. And we've been um, working together on, on publications and materials. So I have thousands of pages of archival documents from those newly opened archives digitized on my computer that I'm working with. Um, as uh, Father Polakowski mentioned, there are uh, you know, tens of millions of documents in these archives, and such as the Vatican archives, of which there are a number, but the Jesuit archives just opened up, the Central Jesuit archives, which were about a block away from the Vatican, opened up just this January, so even more recently. And there are you know, hundreds of thousands of interesting documents there as well for, for various reasons. So uh, on the one hand, there's a huge amount uh, to work through. Uh, and it will take many years till we fully uh, you know, extracted all the important information from them. On the other hand, they are well organized. And uh, over the last 10 years in preparing them for the opening, they've created a lot of finding aids which describe the documents in a fair amount of detail. So that, for example, if you, if you are like me, you're interested in uh, the Pope Pius XII's relationship with Mussolini during the war, you can go to the archives of the papal nuncio to Italy and to a certain other archive, uh, which has these finding aids, which uh, allow you to uh, relatively efficiently look at material. That said, they also, however, limit how many folders of material you can see each day, namely uh, at the main archive, just five. And they make uh, copying it uh, very expensive. I mean, it's practically $10 for pay for the first page from every folder from which you want to copy material. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's incredible richness there and we're finding you know, very interesting things, not least the fact uh, Father Polakowski mentioned that in response to pressures uh, about the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust, uh, the uh, Vatican had uh, commissioned a series for uh, Jesuit scholars to put together what turned to, out to be 12 large volumes, each one having hundreds of documents in it uh, dealing with this history. One thing I have discovered is that uh, although they, they publish much important material, they also systematically left out certain materials that were compromising basically to the Vatican narrative. And um, that's kind of, I'm working on a book right now on this, which uh, hopefully will be out next year that uh, we'll, we'll be- Sorry to interrupt, can, can you say explicitly what is the Vatican narrative? And then, and then what is compromising? Well, the Vatican narrative is that the, um, first of all, that there was no anti-Semitism uh, motivating anyone in the, the Vatican or people around the Pope, they, they were all uh, doing absolutely everything they possibly could to save the maximum number of Jewish lives possible. And um, so, and that uh, if they didn't speak out uh, more forcefully, forcefully at all, it was only because of uh, fear that it would cost more Jewish lives if, if they spoke out. Um, and, you know, that's a narrative. Um, and, you know, I've discovered too that uh, the Pope engaged in um, secret negotiations with Hitler beginning within 
two or three months of becoming Pope. That's never been known. That's uh, all word of that is ex has been excluded from those 12 volumes. So um, yeah, there's much I think we that you are learning despite the fact there were those who said that given the publication of those hundreds of documents, uh, we already largely knew you know, what had happened and there'd be nothing much to, uh, to be learned. I think uh, we're learning that there's a lot to be learned. So I, I'm, I'm trying to weed through some of the questions. We have so many coming in, but uh, some of the people are asking about um, the encyclical that was drafted by Pope Pius XI, which was such a, uh, for Pope Pius XI, I think such a, um, a, a climactic moment in the film, Holy Silence. Um, people are asking, is there any copy of it or, or you know, any way to, to see what, what it actually said? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, the texts are available. There have been any number of books written on it, and uh, um, it was um, it was composed by two uh, Jesuits working independently. Uh, one was the American Jesuit, who was very much involved in the early struggle against racism in this country, Father John Lafarge. Um, the other person was a noted uh, European Scott Catholic scholar of um, kind of the social tradition of Catholicism. Um, the, the part um, condemning anti-Semitism and racism uh, would have been, I think, a very significant contribution. Uh, there are th those who would say, however, that if the other part of it which really still um, uh, described the Catholic Jewish relationship in traditional anti-Judaic terms, um, that that would have been somewhat of a disaster if it had re uh, received approbation from anyone in the Vatican and may well have blocked the ability to totally restate the Catholic Jewish relationship by Vatican II in the document Nostra Aetate, um, uh, chapter four. So, uh, you know, it, there's mixed feelings about whether or not the, um, the proclamations that were in that um, so-called uh, secret document uh, would have helped or hurt the situation overall. Certainly there's no question if they had um, released and with approval Father Lafarge's section, I think it would have it would have helped somewhat. How much, hard to judge, but it would have helped uh, uh, somewhat, I think. But the second part of it might well have been a, a long-term negative. So uh, the, I mean, I think one of the, uh... The important thing to point out there, uh, supplementing what uh, Father Polakowski was saying, is that uh, the Pope Pius XI called, uh, this was kind of a shock to this uh, American Jesuit, John Lafarge, uh, who happened to be in Rome, and he, he got this summons from the Pope to uh, that he wanted to talk to him. So, of course, he was surprised, couldn't imagine what it would be, and was even more surprised when the Pope asked him to write a, uh, to draft an encyclical denouncing racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, normally encyclicals are written by experts around the Vatican and not some <laughs> American yeah. who happen to be in Rome. And the reason was, I, th I think uh, that uh, in my book, The Pope of Mussolini, I talk about this, the, uh, the Pope didn't really trust the, the usual cast of characters who wrote these encyclicals, the, the people around the Vatican, and went way out of normal channels to call on this Jesuit. Uh, but John Lafarge felt the because of uh, Jesuit um, discipline that he needed to inform his the superior of the order, the worldwide superior, who was a, uh, a Polish um, a man named Ledochowski, who had long been head of the uh, Jesuit order and who was, from my point of view, a vicious anti-Semite. And Ledochowski was basically outraged that the Pope was uh, had this idea of an encyclical denouncing anti-Semitism and uh, basically forced on Lafarge this German theologian, the Father Polakowski mentioned, uh, Gunlock, who had written you know, all sorts of, uh, you might say, traditional Christian anti-Jewish kinds of uh, writings in the past. And so 
uh, that may well explain the kind of hodgepodge that, uh, that resulted that uh, Father Pelikoski described well. So we, we have some follow-up questions uh, and, and uh, you, you've already raised the question of, um, it's an impossibility to know an alternative history, right? So, so even with the claim, right? So um, if the Pope had spoken out more forcefully, would the Nazis have attacked the Vatican? Um, would that have harmed the Catholic community? There's no way to know that because that's obviously not what happened. Um, but there, there are questions in terms of um, once the Nazis lost the war, why didn't the Pope do more in terms of, of the follow-up? And particularly some of the questions about um, reuniting Jewish children with their parents, especially those Jewish children who were um, hiding in, in Christian homes or, or in monasteries in, in, uh, in Catholic um, institutions. Um, and, and I will just say, I mean, obviously that, that's a story that predates the Nazi regime. Um, I, I first kind of got to know you as um, Dr. Kurtzer through uh, the kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara, which, uh, mm -hmm. which I read in, in college um, and that story. And so this is not a story that's exclusive for World War II, um, but I know from your article in the Atlantic, that was part of what you discovered in the archives were um, efforts to hinder reuniting children with their parents. And, and I wonder if you could speak more about that. Yes, and then maybe later we can turn to the question of whether it would have made any difference um, for the Pope to speak out or what he could have said that would have made any difference. But in terms of the post-war period on this issue of the Holocaust surviving children, um, my Atlantic piece focused on probably the best known case, which was the these two Jewish brothers, uh, the Sinhalese brothers in France. But in some ways they were typical in that their parents they were, were arrested and sent to their death in, in concentration camp in Germany, left behind these two little children who were like one and three years old at the time. They ended up being cared for by um, Catholic women and in, in Catholic institutions. And then at the end of the war, the, uh, the siblings of the parents of the, who had survived uh, came to bring them back. So it wasn't just Jews in general, it was actually their their aunts and uncles who wanted to, to bring them back to, into their families. And uh, the uh, group of people who, um, who were keeping them, uh, including uh, a number of uh, nuns, uh, religious women nuns and, and uh, monks, ended up hiding them because the courts, the French courts were ruling that they needed to be returned to their family. And um, so this, uh, you know, we don't know how many cases of this uh, existed. Uh, there were many uh, children who were, became orphaned by the Jewish children who became orphaned by the Holocaust uh, in places like Poland, of course, which had the largest, you know, had 3 million Jews before the war uh, and other parts of, of Europe. There were likely thousands who were uh, survived the war while their parents went off to their deaths and survived the war protected in by either Catholic families, if we're now just talking about the Catholic part of this, or Catholic institutions. Um, now, uh, many of them were baptized, and uh, we just don't know how many never made their way back uh, to the parents. One thing that we have discovered as a result of the newly opened archives, and that was the subject of my Atlantic article that you mentioned earlier uh, last August, uh, was that the, uh, the Pope and the, the Vatican um, and the Inquisition Office or the, the Holy Office uh, was asked to weigh in by the uh, prelates involved in this in, in France. And their advice was to hold out as long as possible if it becomes uh, impossible because actually quite a few monks and nuns were being arrested. At a certain point you have to um, give in, do so, but uh, do what you can to avoid that because and here we get back to this same kind of theological issue that involved the Mortara case back in the 19th century, the notion that children who had been um, baptized now should be regarded as Catholic and it would be a sin for them to be returned to Jewish family because then they would be guilty of apostasy. Let me just add a word about the, um, the question of why Pius XII didn't uh, do or say more uh, after the war had ended. I think to, uh, I, and I'm not defending him at all on this, but if you want to understand it fully, I think you have to understand the politics of immediate post-war Germany. 
uh, the Catholic community has felt itself to be second class in Germany uh, after the Kulturkampf and was looking for ways to kind of restore its, uh, its equality with the Protestant church um, uh, since the Kulturkampf. And some uh, regrettably, both during the Nazi era, but especially in that immediate post-war era when you had the first Catholic chancellor of Germany, they did not want to write or do anything that they felt would undermine the uh, integrity of the uh, Catholics who had come into power in, um, in Germany in terms of political leadership. And as I say, while I don't defend that, I think if you want to understand it, you do have to understand the situation somewhat in the context of immediate uh, post-war politics in Germany. And the fact too that, uh, and I'm sure David, you know this quite well, there was a tradition of Catholic history and Protestant history and the twain never met. Uh, they each had their versions uh, of the religious history of Germany over the centuries. And strangely, this did not even disappear uh, after the, uh, not least not immediately, uh, after the, um, uh, the, the, the end of uh, the Hitler regime. Um, so these, the, there's, there's a lot of complexity within the German political and historical scene that did affect how the uh, period of the Holocaust was described uh, by, his, by historians in the immediate years following World War II. There's, there's two different ways I can follow up on that. And I'm, I'm trying to keep it all together because there's, there's so much here. And, um, but let me, let me start by, first of all, asking, we're getting a number of questions, Father Polakowski, in terms of, uh, you know, we're, we're framing this in terms of the lessons learned. And so the question of looking back at this history and, and recognizing, um, well, I, I guess I shouldn't assume whether or not there is a recognition of some of the mistakes, whether or not there are lessons learned from that. Um, has that changed the way that the Catholic Church has responded in other moral crises? And, and some of the questions that have come up specifically relate to um, the rise of white supremacy in the United States or the persecution of LGBTQ individuals within Poland. Um, but I, I'm sure there's lots of other examples across the world. Is the Catholic Church responding differently in these situations? Um, well, in some cases, yes. Um, I mean, there have been uh, leading uh, bishops uh, and cardinals um, who supported um, efforts at uh, social justice in many parts of the world and, and spoke out um, against um, the oppression and deprivation of people um, in terms of human rights. Uh, human rights really does not become a solid central concept in Catholic social teaching uh, until uh, after the Nazi era. Uh, I did mention the example, might be a small isolated example, but the example of the bishops of Malawi when they faced the, um, the attacks uh, from the president Hastings Banda uh, and so on. And uh, while they never made reference that I, that I know of to the um, experience of the Holocaust, uh, it does represent a counter, uh, counter witness. And there were people who did stand up, uh, even of some bishops who did stand up against Nazism, uh, but they were hardly the majority. Uh, most were, were either supportive or were at least silent and so on. Um, I think that I don't think that at this point yet, even in, in the current um, milieu of Catholic social ethics, um, the Holocaust is seen at, at the Holocaust era is seen as an absolutely critical uh, period for examination of Catholic responsibility. 
Um, usually, if we do a history of Catholic social teaching, we jump from the two encyclicals that social encyclicals that were issued prior to Vatican II to the period of the Second Vatican Council. And even a, a, a good friend of mine and an outstanding Catholic ethicist, Father Charles Curran, if you look at his writings on Catholic so social teaching, he gives a, a, a few footnotes to the Nazi era, but that is it. There is no solid examination of, um, uh, of that period in terms of what we can learn um, uh, on Catholic social teaching. I think contemporary Catholicism at various levels has been at best uh, moderately adequate on the issue of racism. Um, the most recent statement from the American bishops uh, is seen as rather disappointing, to put it mildly, especially by uh, many in the, in the African-American Catholic Church. Um, I, I would have to say that uh, the general position of the Catholic uh, leadership, including the Vatican, um, on LGBTQ issues is dismal from my point of view. And even Pope Francis, who on some occasions uh, has given more positive signals in terms of acceptance, uh, has also uh, at other times um, repeated the, uh, the classical, uh, I'll call it attack on LGBTQ people. Uh, that has been central to Catholicism, and not only Catholicism, but speaking as a Catholic. So uh, I don't think, um, and, and you know, we need to remember that uh, uh, gay, gay people, mostly gay men, not very many lesbians, but mostly gay men and mostly German gay men, some from a, a few other parts, such as Poland, but uh, were attacked as part of the Nazi ideology of uh, basic human degradation. Although uh, it, the, the, the gay uh, victims of the Nazis were seen as people who had the possibility of rehabilitation, whereas um, uh, Jews had no possibility of rehabilitation, even being baptized was not something that could save them uh, for most for most uh, of the Nazi leaders. They were still inherently um, a, a, a negative force on humanity. We're, we're getting a number of questions about um, Nazis who escaped Germany during the war and whether there's any evidence or uh, or any implication that the Vatican helped with that in any way? Um, yes, although um, yeah, th there's actually a pretty good book called Nazis on the Run by a scholar who's looked into this issue. And um, it's a complicated history. There was the, the Austrian bishop who's in charge of kind of the German church in Rome, uh, his name is Hudal, uh, I think quite clearly helped a number of Nazi war criminals escape um, Europe. And others were involved in the so-called rat line as well. Um, one of the complications is they're not the only one, that is the Catholic Church, certainly, or the Vatican, not the only institution involved in helping Nazi war criminals escape. It seems that uh, American CIA and, and others were uh, in, presumably in a context of uh, the war on communism being more important than fighting against the Nazis. Um, and it still remains, I haven't seen any documents that, that I've come across in these newly open archives that you know, get at any direct responsibility of the Pope, which sometimes comes up. Uh, so it's, uh, that said, um, I mean, one thing I have, uh, I do see is that for the Vatican, there were the good Nazis and the bad Nazis, just like there were the good fascist, Italian fascists and the bad fascists. And the, the difference from the Vatican point of view, if I can generalize a little bit, is the 
good fascists and the good Nazis uh, wanted to support the institutional church and the bad Nazis and bad fascists were anti-clerics and anti-church and trying to produce the influence of the church. Um, so you, you had, for example, uh, Ernst von Weizsäcker, who had been the number two to Ribbentrop at the Secretary of at Foreign Ministry uh, during the first several years of the war, the Nazi foreign ministry became the ambassador to the Vatican in the summer of 1943. And uh, following the war, he was uh, one of the people of Nuremberg on trial for crimes against humanity. And the Vatican did everything it could to argue that he was not one of the bad Nazis, he was a good Nazi. So um, this was another kind of distinction that I think is a bit behind the question of uh, what the Vatican or the church did within in individual cases. I would uh, just add to that. Um, there is some indication that something called the Croatian College in um, in Rome. Uh, there are many countries Catholic, uh, that have a strong Catholic uh, identity uh, established places essentially for education of priests in Rome, and the Croatian College was one such entity. And I think there's little question that they had some role in aiding and abetting um, uh, the so-called rat line. Um, however, there have been some people who have written on this who have kind of said, well, it was a pontifical uh, college and therefore uh, the Pope probably knew about what was going on there. Uh, there, there are hundreds if not thousands of institutions that have the title pontifical uh, added to their name. Uh, many of them are in Rome. I can assure you that the Pope has no idea what goes on day to day in those places. Now, there was a few years ago, and I don't know, David, if you've ever seen these documents, some documents discovered in the um, Argentine consulate in, in Rome which seem to establish a greater level of um, knowledge among key Vatican officials regarding this red line. But, uh, you know, that's also an indication that some of the, perhaps some of the more important documents on this may not in fact be in the Vatican archives. They may be in, in state archives somewhere. Uh, for example, uh, you know, one of the, the late John Morley, whom I'm sure uh, you know, uh, David, um, on his book on Vatican diplomacy, uh, always argued that one thing Pius XII could have done is to um, really instruct his papal nuncios to make saving Jews a priority. Several of them did, including uh, the future John XXIII, but it would be very interesting to know more about any interchanges on that question between these nuncios and, and the Vatican. Now, I realize communication was not easy, but it didn't, wasn't totally absent. And uh, I suspect there was some give and take and maybe in terms of letters and cables from these nuncios to the Vatican regarding this issue of uh, uh, trying to save Jews through false baptismal certificates and so on. Well, the, um, just one point there, the probably the most important nuncio from this point of view is the, uh, the papal nuncio to Germany, Cesare Orsenigo, and he was uh, constantly uh, trying to make Hitler look better than he was. I mean, and um, you know, he was really uh, one of the more uh, saddest cases, I think, in, in this whole history. He had been appointed strangely by Pius XI, uh, despite the fact he didn't have much in the way of uh, any knowledge of the, the greater world. And he, uh, <laughs> to Berlin became uh, kind of in, in enamored of uh, by his proximity to Hitler and so forth. And so I have you know, been reading his you know, hundreds of his reports to to the Vatican, and uh, which the Pope got to read, and uh, you know they're uh, remarkable given what was going on. For still trying to argue that, well, on the one hand, he couldn't really have any influence over these matters because Hitler said it was you know, none of the church, the Vatican's business; it was a domestic affair. And but secondly, that uh, things got exaggerated, and actually there were a lot of 
yes, there were some bad Nazis, but a lot of them were basically good Christians. And uh, so the Pope shouldn't worry too much about the neo-pagan aspects of the Nazi regime. You know, I uh, just uh, mentioned uh, in terms of the post uh, post uh, Holocaust uh, situation and Pius XII, um, one of the strongest critics, critics of Pius XII was the Catholic, noted Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain, who resigned as the um, uh, French ambassador to the Vatican in protest over um, Pius XII's refusal to really challenge um, uh, German Catholics in the uh, years right after World War II. So this is, this is gonna take us into a slightly different direction, but I have to confess my own curiosity in this. Um, in the film, um, the, the film created a lot of drama around uh, this moment just before Pope Pius XI was uh, convening the, the convocation of, of the bishops and the cardinals and, and this, uh, this encyclical, and then of course died just before. And people wanna know if there are conspiracy theories around that. Um, is, is there a kind of an investigation? Is there, is there any talk? I mean, and, and, and did the film over-dramatize that? Well, you know, when I began working on my book uh, on Pope Pius XI and, and Mussolini, the Pope and Mussolini, uh, I was talking to someone in Italy and uh, mentioned I was going to be writing this book on, on Pius XI, and she said, oh, the one who was killed by Mussolini. Um, so there, Italians actually are uh, quite uh, fine to, Conspiracy theories quite convincing in many cases. But Mussolini wouldn't have killed him because he was going to speak out about anti-Semitism. That would have been a different reason. No, well, that was part of it. So um, there are two different things. The encyclical is one thing, but actually what you're referring to is there was going to be this huge occasion on the 10th anniversary of the Lateran Pax, which is what established Vatican City, which is what ended separation of church and state in Italy and established the Catholic Church as the basically official uh, state religion and gave it various benefits. This was all um, negotiated between Mussolini and the, and the Vatican, uh, Vatican Secretary of State at the time. So this was maybe the 10th anniversary and Mussolini had long been hailing this as you know, one of his great accomplishments, bringing peace with the church. Um, and I know from reading the reports of his Mussolini's ambassador to the, to the Holy See, as well as from his spies in the Vatican, because he had quite a few spies in the Vatican, you can read their reports, uh, they were all telling him that on that anniversary occasion where all 350 or so bishops of Italy were going to be there along with the world press, uh, the Pope was going to denounce Mussolini for embracing Hitler and his anti-Semitism and his racism. Uh, so Mussolini, we know, was very worried about this. And uh, the fact that the Pope dies one day before he's supposed to give this speech uh, led to all this conspiracy theory, which... Um, was furthered by the fact that the, uh, the Pope's own doctor at the time was sick in bed that week. And the number two man, if we can call him that, in the Vatican physician service was the father of Mussolini's lover, Clara Petacci, uh, Dr. Uh, Petacci. And so, you know, you can easily see the scenario. However, uh, I probably would have sold a lot more copies of my book if I had found evidence that this actually took place, but I didn't. So, Father John, this, this is not a conversation within the, the church at all. Which, uh, which? Uh, the, the, any conspiracy theories around the death of, uh, of Pius XI? Well, it, it's certainly not. I, I haven't heard any um, uh, outside of Italy. I, I think uh, Professor Kurtzer is correct that um, within Italy, there, there probably are some, and within the Italian church, I don't think that there's, I mean, you'd have to go back. I, I, I'm i not a, a, a scholar on Pius uh, XI. Um, you'd have to go back and look at um, some of the major Catholic publications such as America and uh, Commonweal and others and what they may have said uh, about the death of Pius XI and whether they associated any sinister uh, forces uh, in terms of bringing about his death uh, at this very crucial time, uh, but uh, that's not that's not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> in terms, there, of 
Fair enough. Well, so, you know, before um, we're, we're kind of coming to an end, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times, so I'll pose it. I don't know um, if this also goes out of both of your wheelhouse, but uh, you referenced earlier, uh, Father Polakowski, I think you specifically said it, that there's a Protestant history as its own history as well. And so a few people have asked about the role of uh, the Protestant church, specifically the Lutheran church, and um, whether they were complicit. And um, was, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer an, an exception to the rule or, uh, or a model within that? Well, uh, I think as Professor Kurtzer has already um, indicated, um, the, the Protestant church was very split on um, the question of Hitler. There was an element of the church which strongly supported and identified um, the so-called uh, German um, uh, Christian movement, uh, the Deutsche Christian movement, um, which really embraced uh, Hitler as kind of God's best man for Germany at the time. Um, there was also, uh, and you didn't have a whole lot of that kind of public embrace, especially organized public embrace within the Catholic Church at the time. Um, uh, there were some who did embrace Nazism. My uh, colleague, um, Professor, uh, Father uh, Kevin Spicer uh, of Stonehill College and formerly of Notre Dame, uh, has written extensively on the so-called brown priests who um, did collaborate in one way or another directly with the Nazi uh, uh, leadership. Um, now, uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, the, the Nazis, you know, the Nazis uh, didn't particularly um, relish Christian uh, involvement. Uh, you know, they brown one of the one of the um, uh, expressions of frustration on the part of some of the brown priests was that they they couldn't move up the hierarchy uh, in the Nazi system. They their their support was accepted, but it did not lead to um, uh, no matter what they did, it did not lead to any kind of promotion within the Nazi bureaucracy. Um, so yes, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and, uh, was uh, an exception, even though uh, certainly early on in his theological career, he did express some very classical um, uh, ideas about the Jewish Christian relationship, which certainly were not positively, were not positive in terms of the uh, outlook on Jews and Judaism, but he he clearly um, uh, became a staunch opponent of Hitler. Uh, got jailed, died died a short time in a Nazi in a, died in the Nazi prison a short time uh, prior to the end of the war and so on. So um, I I know a little bit something of that because I. I, I was a collaborator to an extent with one of his um, relatives, Everhard Betke, who uh, knew um, Professor Everhard Betke, who was very, was part of the family and knew some of the things that happened in that uh, inner circle. Uh, so yeah, Bonhoeffer would clearly, um, and he decided, you may remember Bonhoeffer came to the United States to study and uh, as the Nazi era was beginning. And then he had to face the challenge, does he go back? And he decided to go back and try to establish a, a, a kind of new version, not, not totally, I think what he would maybe better say, a purified version of uh, Christianity. Um, he had a, a kind of underground seminary going and so on. Uh, and he, um, he really tried to uh, uh, try to develop a church that would be free of the kind of political machinations that he saw in the Protestant church. Another person who did stand up to an extent was the famous Protestant theologian Karl Barth, but um, 
he was rather in a safe place outside of Germany. Uh, and he had some influence definitely on the, uh, the, the uh, Deutsche Christian movement. Um, and, you know, they did issue a proclamation condemning Nazism. There was also a proclamation that in words was not all that different uh, by the German Bishops Conference in Fulda, that met in Fulda. Um, and um, however, once the Concordat was signed, the formal agreement between the Vatican or the Holy See and the, uh, the Nazi regime, that Fulda document was went into the deep freeze and was not really referenced um, during the rest of the Nazi era. Well, let me let me just uh, say I'm I'm mindful of the time. I know we um, we've already gone a couple of minutes over, um, and so I'm I'm going to um, I'm actually going to invite each of you to give a final word. But but let me before I do that, I'm I'm actually just going to say a, a profound thank you to both of you um, for for sharing of your wisdom of your expertise, um, this, this openness, this vulnerability um, of really grappling with this incredibly painful time in history and really modeling a way that, that we can do that in dialogue with one another. Um, I wanna um, thank our partners in this, um, hosted by the Danforth Center for Religion and Politics at Washington University, um, the Barnardin Center at Catholic Theological Union and uh, the Newmark Institute for Human Relations at the Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, just, I'm gonna let both of you get the final word because, because this is what both of you have committed your time to. I, I think, you know, just kind of with all of this, um, any, any final reflections or, or anything that you wanna say in terms of closing us out? Again, with the recognition we've already gone over. Uh, I'm, 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 go ahead. <laughs> oh, I would just say something similar to what Archbishop Gallagher, of the, uh, currently in the Vatican, the number two man in the Secretary of State said, when, um, when the, new, the Vatican archives were opened, um, he said, let's keep an open mind and see what it comes, comes out of this study. Uh, by all means, we should study it. And uh, once we have a clear idea of what the picture was, uh, we need to be able to mount a response. And that is uh, certainly my, uh, my approach to this current situation. And I would uh, just add my thanks to you for organizing this and to uh, Father Palakowski. Uh, it's been, uh, I think, as you know, we've heard and seen, these are just very important issues with all sorts of implications today in terms of uh, the use of religion to demonize minorities, so whatever that religion may be. Uh, aside from the specific issue of the understanding the you know, attempt to exterminate Europe's Jews. Um, and those of us who've been working in this area are often subject to various kinds of vilification as anybody can go online and see uh, and various ad hominem attacks. So it's, it's um, you know, it is refreshing to have these occasions to have these kind of serious discussions. And uh, uh, given the fact that we've just gotten such a huge amount of new material to look through over the next uh, two, three, four years, uh, these discussions will only be further enriched. Well, thank you again. Thank you to everyone who joined us. And um, I, I should say that uh, when I first reached out to you, Professor Kurtzer, about coming, I think you agreed to do this talk on condition that we get you to actually come to St. Louis when uh, when we're able to travel again, when your next book comes out. Um, and so we look forward to hosting that and Father Polakowski to, to bringing you from Chicago, I hope as well, um, in a time where uh, it'd be wonderful to all be in a room together. But for now, I'm, I'm grateful we were able to have this virtual space. I know we had people joining us from all across the country, not just from uh, where I am in St. Louis, not to mention that both of you are, are all over. Um, and so, uh, so thank you all for taking some time out of your night and for participating. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. -bye.